Okay, we have two tasks left here before we can uh, perform a muscle actuated forward dynamic simulation. We need to parameterize our muscle models and we need to determine our initial uh, muscle states. So in this video, let's tackle uh, the big task of parameterizing the muscle models. Um, if we revisit the muscle model from homework number one, we can see that we had a large number of parameter values here defined for our uh, hill muscle model. And for most of these parameters, I just arbitrarily made up values for them that are just kind of reasonable just to get the model to run. Um, for classroom exercises, that's okay. Um, for making a model of the whole body that is supposed to ideally realistically simulate real human motion, you don't want to just invent arbitrary parameter values here. You want to have a good reason for picking the values that you pick for the parameters. Um, in particular, when we are defining uh, values that are supposed to be representing a specific muscle or a specific muscle group, in our case is the, the gluteal muscle group and the vasti muscle group, you want to make sure you're picking uh, muscle parameter values here that are faithfully and accurately representing the uh, force producing capabilities of, of those muscles. And so that's our task here for today. Where do we get uh, parameter values here that can realistically represent the uh, force producing capabilities of the vasti and the gluteal so that we can define them here in the parameter values for our model. Um, this is a difficult task. This is one of uh, the most difficult tasks, I would say, in modeling and simulation and biomechanics, this task of uh, defining uh, a proper and realistic muscle model parameters. Uh, lots of different approaches to it. Um, I uploaded four papers here for you guys to take a look at that all uh, cover this topic of defining uh, muscle model parameters. Um, one option is that you can use uh, cadaver data. Um, this first paper here, Ward et al., is a, a study of human cadavers where they took a large number of measurements of the lower limb. And so this will provide data for things like fiber length and muscle mass and pination angle. Um, some of these values could be used uh, directly in specifying muscle model parameters. Some might only uh, give you a starting point, but uh, they're, uh, regardless they're, uh, of the use, they're a great source of uh, where to start at least for getting uh, muscle specific model parameters. Um, if you're not okay with just muscle specific parameters, if you want uh, subject specific parameters, um, that's a much bigger task. Um, this second study here by Hassan and Caldwell um, uh, goes through a procedure that they developed here for generating not just muscle specific but subject specific model parameters. Here they were looking at a group of uh, young adults and at a group of older adults. And as you read through this, you, like me, might be struck by the, the sheer amount of effort that went into defining uh, subject-specific muscle model parameters for a single joint, the ankle joint, and for just uh, three muscles of that joint, for a, a dorsiflexor muscle and for two uh, plantar flexor muscles. They did basically everything here. Um, they did uh, biodex dynamometer measurements of, of uh, joint strength, you know, the, the, the torque that, muscle, that uh, the joint can produce at, at different angles and different angular velocities. Uh, they did EMG recordings of those muscles during those contractions. Um, they did MRI measurements of the ankle joint to get the, the shape of the bones and the size and shape of the muscles. Uh, they did ultrasound to measure the extension of the tendon and the orientation of the fibers when, when the subjects were doing these contractions. And they finally did musculoskeletal modeling to, to simulate those contractions on a subject-specific basis and optimize the muscle model parameters so that the um, subjects and the models' um, joint-level strength profiles were, were realistic in comparison to each other. Um, out of the end of that is a table like this that gives you uh, average values here in these these different groups of subjects the uh, broken down by age and broken down by sex here uh, for these different muscles and different uh, subject specific muscle model parameters here a tremendous amount of, of, of effort and work and resources going into doing this uh, even for a single joint with a small number of muscles and then envision doing that for like an entire uh, human body and lots of joints and, and lots of muscles so uh, obtaining subject specific muscle model parameters is, is a very difficult task and uh, currently in biomechanics. And then lastly here, another approach uh, in the in a second Vandenbogert paper, an older Vandenbogert paper from 1998. Um, here they go over a number of uh, issues in uh, muscle modeling. Um, one approach that they do suggest is an approach for uh, parameterizing hill muscle models here in figure three, where you take measurements of how much torque human joints can produce 
in uh, different types of contractions, say contractions at uh, different angles of the joint. And you would then simulate those same contractions in your musculoskeletal model. And while you're simulating those contractions, optimize your muscle model parameters so that your model's uh, joint strength profile here uh, resembles your measured human joint strength profile as well as possible. So getting a set of parameters there uh, that then help you mimic uh, realistic human uh, joint level strength profiles. Uh, last paper that I uploaded for you guys to take a look at is uh, Raja Gopal here. And uh, this one is the paper that accompanies the full body model we've been using in OpenSim. Um, down here under section B of their methods, they go over their muscle model and where they got their muscle model parameters from. Some came from a cadaver study, some from an MRI study, and then they made some adjustments to those uh, parameters here based on uh, the, uh, the uh, joint level strength of, of the model that they were working with. Um, because we used our Raja Gopal model here to define our muscle length parameters, um, we are also going to use the Raja Gopal model to define at least some of our muscle mechanics parameters um, because this is a, a previously published and validated model and so we know we'll be working uh, ideally with a consistent set of uh, parameters there. So we are going to turn to this uh, uh, full body model here to get at least some of our muscle model parameters. So let's load up that model here. And there it is. And if I open up in my navigator, and then open up my forces, and then open up my muscles, and let's just look at the right leg. And if I click on the muscle here, like a glute max two, which is one of the ones I was working with, um, down here under properties, it'll show me a number of parameter values for that muscle. It's got max isometric force, it's got optimal fiber length, unloaded tendon length, and optimal pination angle and a variety of other uh, parameters here for this muscle. So I can take these values here and we will transfer them into our muscle model here. At least we will transfer some of them. Um, max isometric force, we're gonna skip for now. I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, optimal CC length in the nomenclature of OpenSim, that's optimal fiber length, which for this gluteal muscle was 0.157. Uh, tendon slack length, for us that's unloaded SEC length, and that was uh, 0.068. And then the pination angle at optimal CC length, that was uh, 0.367 radians. Okay, so we at least have a start here. Um, the max isometric force for this uh, gluteal muscle was 14.06. Um, but if you look here in the all of the muscles in this full body model, they actually have three uh, glute max muscles. They have a glute max one, glute max two, glute max three. Um, because this is a three dimensional model, um, they wanted to realistically represent the three dimensional geometry of the gluteal muscles. And so there they actually had uh, three separate strands here. Uh, representing different uh, anatomical parts of the glute max muscle, so splitting it up into to three muscles. Um, in our two-dimensional model, that's not quite as much of a concern. We don't need to be as, as concerned with representing the 3D geometry of the muscle, but we do want to make sure we're, we're representing the full strength of that muscle. So we are going to take our three glute max max isometric forces here and add them up to give us our uh, glute max max isometric force. So the first one is 983, let's just call it 1,000. Second one is uh, 1,400, so we're up to 2,400. And third one is, uh, let's just call it another 1,000, so we're up to 3,400. So we will plug in 3,400 here for our max isometric force for our uh, gluteal muscle there. Now, gluteal or glute max is not the only gluteal hip extensor in the uh, lower limb here. Um, gluteus medius is um, also another fairly strong gluteal muscle that is primarily involved in uh, abduction of the hip, but it also has a, a flexion moment arm. As you, and you can see here that gluteus medius is also a strong muscle, about a about 1,000 newtons there and about another 800 newtons there, so 1,800, and about another 900 there, so about, oh, what's that up to, 2,700 uh, newtons of force here from gluteus medius. 
uh, gluteus medius has a smaller uh, hip extension moment arm than gluteus maximus, so I'm not going to take all uh, 2700 newtons of force there and add it to my existing 3400, but I'm just going to fudge this up here to about 5000 newtons of force to, to make sure that I'm uh, representing the full strength of, of all the gluteal muscles there. Okay, we will also repeat this process for our second muscle in our model, which was vastus lateralis. And there is its optimal CC length, 0 0.099 meters. And its unloaded SEC length is 0 0.221 meters. And its pination angle is 0 0.253 radians. Uh, max isometric force here for vastus lateralis is about 5,000 newtons, but there's actually three vasti muscles. There's vastus lateralis, so 5,000. There's vastus medialis, which is another uh, about 2,700, so we're up to 7,700. And there's vastus intermedius, which is another uh, 1,700, and so that gets us, what's that, 7,700 plus 1,700, that's 9,400 newtons. So 9,400 will be our strength of uh, the vast eye muscles there. Um, one more adjustment we will make here to our max isometric forces is remember our um, model here only has one leg. It's just got one hip and one knee. Um, what we're assuming there is that there's actually two legs, but they're acting uh, symmetrically. And so we need to here represent the strength of the muscles in both the left leg and the right leg acting uh, uh, synchronously and in symmetry at the same time. And so we're actually going to double these max isometric forces, um, doubling them again because here we're trying to represent the strength of those muscles in both legs, not just in uh, one leg. Okay, that gives us some of our muscle model parameters that we needed here. Um, if we review the full set that we need in our muscle model, um, I also need a value here for my uh, CC force length width. Um, that's generally a parameter that you will see defined on a, a muscle-specific basis, and you'll generally define this parameter based on uh, wanting the muscle to produce uh, non-zero forces over a realistic range of motion. So you might tune this parameter, uh, for example, based on some dynamometry data and in terms of what angles uh, certain muscles at certain joints can and cannot produce substantial forces. Um, for our purposes here, we are going to do a little bit simpler approach and just assume a value of uh, 0.5 there for W for all of our muscles. Um, what this is saying is that these uh, muscles here in our model can produce non-zero CC forces at uh, CC lengths uh, as short as 50% shorter than their optimal length and up to 50% longer than their optimal length. Um, here, if I was doing, say, uh, research-grade musculoskeletal modeling, if this was like a study I was trying to publish, um, I probably wouldn't just make up an arbitrary value here for uh, W. I would probably tune this parameter on a muscle-specific basis to do something like get realistic uh, levels of, of joint strength at, at particular angles or particular ranges of motion in my model. But for this exercise here, I'm, uh, at the time being at least, just going to specify a kind of arbitrary value there. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the same here for a lot of my other muscle model parameters. We already specified the minimum excitation, but I'm gonna go ahead and assume that both of my muscles here um, have the same value for the uh, SEC strain at the max isometric force, same value for max shortening velocity, uh, same eccentric plateau, and uh, same gamma for my transition velocity here. Again, there's no particular motivation for assigning the same values for all of these, for all muscles, other than just uh, simplicity here in this exercise. These are very much parameters uh, that could vary uh, from muscle to muscle and from person to person. So if you were doing, uh, say, subject-specific muscle modeling or, or research-grade muscle-specific muscle modeling, these are parameters that you may want to at least consider uh, defining on a, a muscle-specific basis and a subject-specific basis. Um, these generally, for most movements, with the possible exception here of, of USEC, which can be an important parameter, um, these three up here, the max isometric force, the optimal CC length, and the unloaded SEC length. Uh, simulation results, at least in, in my experience, tend to be more sensitive to these parameters than they are to these parameters. But nonetheless, these ones can, of course, still have an influence. Um, any, any parameter here, of course, has an influence 
um, on the model. So in, in research grade studies, you want to be careful and thoughtful about how you define each of these parameters. Okay, we had another set of muscle model parameters here that were what we called calculated parameters. These were parameter values that were uh, calculated as functions of our other parameters here. Um, I am going to copy all of those over, um, not to my muscle parameters script, but to my model function. And since I'm calculating these parameter values from other muscle parameters, and because some of those parameters vary on a muscle specific basis, I'm going to actually calculate those parameters inside my loop here where I'm doing my, my muscle mechanics. So we'll calculate some muscle model parameters and just paste that in there. Okay, and I'm going to make a, a couple modifications here. Um, FT here, my fast twitch fiber fraction, is a muscle specific parameter. So I'm going to index that with my looping variable, looping over all my muscles. And FT also appears down here. Um, here, this tau1 and tau2 from my original muscle model, those were my um, activation dynamics time constants. Um, here, in my musculoskeletal model, I called my joint moments tau1 and tau2. So I don't want to call my um, uh, time constants also tau1 and tau2. MATLAB will get confused there and, and probably produce some wonky results. So let's call those uh, TC for time constant instead of tau. And then we'll also change those down here. Okay, um, only last change I'm going to make here is that I'm going to pull my um, SEC stiffness calculation, KSEC. Um, I'm going to pull that out of my function here. And I'm going to perform that calculation here in my parameters script. Um, the reason I'm doing that for this variable specifically is because um, when I'm specifying eventually my model initial states, I'm going to need the value of KSEC, and I won't have run uh, this function here yet, so I won't yet have known or won't yet have calculated the value for KSEC if I leave it here in the function. So I'll put it here in the parameters so I can uh, call on this script later and get that KSEC value when I need it. Um, F0 here has two values in it, and LU here has two values in it, so we need to tell MATLAB to do um, algebraic operations here, not... Uh, matrix operations, and so that will give me my um, SEC stiffness. Okay, and we are all set there with, um, at least I think, all of the muscle model parameters that we need to uh, run our model and perform our simulations. Um, again here, I was uh, fairly hand wavy with how I defined some of the muscle model parameters in this video. I, I was a little hand wavy here with defining my uh, max isometric forces, and I was very hand wavy here with defining my, my force length width parameter and, and some of these other parameters here. Um, these are generally things that you want to uh, take some care in defining and in specifying uh, reasonable good values for and realistic uh, values for when you're doing research grade uh, simulations here. So this is kind of a case of uh, do as I say, not as I do. Here I just kind of arbitrarily made up some of these parameter values um, you, don't you don't really want to do that a lot of the time in uh, research grade computer modeling and simulation. You want to put a great deal of uh, uh, thought and care and, and possibly doing some sensitivity analyses uh, when uh, actually defining these parameter values in research. Okay, that takes care of our um, task here on parameterizing muscle models. And we have one final task remaining before we can run the simulations in determining the initial muscle states, and we will save that for the next video.